Does anybody have any questions before we start today? I heard some people wondering about that quiz. How'd the quiz go? I don't know. It went. I did not get a chance to uh, look at my hit list, so those of you who did not pass will be getting a little email from me, uh, reopening it up and uh, uh, emphasizing the importance of being able to make it through fairly easily with that test. It should be starting to come a little fluent. You may need to hit uh, some things a little harder than others, but that is life. All right. Um, so last time we started building a model of comparative advantage called the Ricardian trade model. So if you happen to be gone last time, you need to redraw this. Otherwise, you guys who were here already have this and don't need to redraw it. Just open your notes to that point. So we've got the United States to the left, Japan to the right, and we learned that if we devoted all resources in the United States economy to the production of food, the United States could produce 8,000 units of food. Otherwise, they could produce, uh, let's try to make this roughly 16,000 cars or anywhere in between. So we ended up having a production possibilities curve that was really a line. So the production possibilities curve in this case is a line. It re represents the outer boundary of possibilities. So something we hadn't talked about yet, but you did in your homework, those of you who have worked on that already, is uh, what if we're inside the boundary at point A? Is that possible? Yes, so it's a production possibility, but what's the deal of it? What does this model say that's the deal with point A? Not it's inefficient, it's not maximizing what? Something, Something. yeah, what is, what is it not maximizing? <laughs> the use of the resources. So the production possibilities frontier gives the maximum combination of two goods an economy can produce given its available resources and technology. That's the definition of the production possibilities curve. So it sh did we define that ever in writing? We need to. Okay. I think it's in it's in the Tom and Jen Island stuff, but so let, let's make sure we're clear on this. The production possibilities curve, also sometimes referred to as the frontier. What is it? It shows the maximum combination shows the maximum combination of two goods and economy can produce given available resources and technology. The maximum combination of two goods an economy can produce given its available resources and technology. So to tie this back to what we did earlier, the economy has scarce resources of a certain amount, whatever they are. It's the bucket level of land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Whatever we got, we got at a point in time. What the production possibilities <laughs> frontier or the production possibilities curve speaks to is what we can make from those resources, from those scarce resources. So we could be at a point like eight and zero, 16 and zero, or here, 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 or here. We can be at any of these points. When we're at a point like A, 
we're doing something not as good as we could be doing. Because it's saying that, gosh, you know what? If you were doing something different, you could be at a point like B that has more of both goods. The same result we got with Tom and Jen on the island on coconuts and fish. So this is the production possibilities curve. If we're efficient, if we're acting efficiently, we're on the edge of that curve. Otherwise, maybe we've got some unused resources or the, we're not using technology to its uh, fullest extent in terms of figuring out who's the best fisherman and who's the best coconut harvester and, and specializing according to what we're good at. All right, now, uh, what about point, uh, I guess I don't know, let's go ABC, I guess. What about point C? What's the deal with point C? It's not attainable with the amount of resources. Plain and simple, or technology. So given today's technology, given today's quantity of labor, given today's quantity of capital, given today's quantity of natural resources, we cannot get to this point. It's impossible. It's not possible. That's why we created the production possibilities curve. It reflects all possibilities. It's right there. We can be inside, but we can't be outside. So really, this whole triangular region represents all production possibilities. The edge represents all possibilities that are efficient. OK, so um, the tougher one then to grapple with is which point's better, B or D? B or D, which one's better? It depends on what you want more of. Now, what we're doing there is we're starting to go outside of what this model does for us. This model shows us production possibilities. It doesn't say that people like food or people like cars. We're not bringing the demand side of life or the consumption side of life into account whatsoever. We're merely exploring all production possibilities. Ultimately, whether B or D is better is dependent upon the consumer or the use of those final goods. That'll be ultimately what's better. As far as production possibilities go, though, they are both equally efficient. <coughs> both points B and D are equal in terms of production or productive efficiency. So note, all points along the production possibilities curve are equally productively, production or productive, I'm going to use those two, productively efficient. PE, production efficiency or productively efficient points. And the key to key thing to embrace here is that they're all equally production efficient. Now, that's where we can make a distinction then between production efficiency and allocative efficiency. Another type, I have a squeaky marker here. I don't know if I got any more blues. Got green, and got lots of red. All right, this looks good. Another uh, type of efficiency takes into account takes into account consumer preferences. Yes. So demand and or, um, let's go ahead and use the fancy word marginal. What did marginal mean again? What's the word you can use interchangeably with marginal? Additional. additional, right? So additional, marginal. So demand and or marginal benefits to consumers of the good. That type of efficiency we're not dealing with currently over here. 
It's called allocative efficiency. You'll see this in chapter two, I believe. So allocative efficiency. It turns out from society standpoint, only one point along these infinite number of production possibilities, only one will be allocatively efficient. Only one point is allocatively efficient, AE. And just to add one last thing on, that is where the cost of production at the margin equal the benefits of production. So that one quantity is where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. That's a bit of an aside. We're going to kind of come around back to that probably later today yet. But it's good to get it on paper right where we're at now. OK, so I'm going to erase these points. If you need to redraw these two things, or hopefully you just kept the one we had from before. I want to go back to what we left off with last time. We did identify a point uh, at 4 and 8, didn't we? Or did we not? Did we have a point there? We are going to use that. I haven't even quite got there yet. but So um, in Japan, the labor productivity showed us that one worker on average could produce 25 cars. There's 1,000 workers, so they could produce 25,000 cars as a country. In food production, they could do five units of food. And so the horizontal intercept was five. If they devoted all 1,000 workers towards food production, they could have five, or they could be anywhere in between. And so the production possibilities curve for Japan looked like that. All right, so then we needed to start thinking about the pattern or the direction of trade, wh which where it's going to go. So we calculated the cost of a food in the United States, correct? Did we calculate the cost of a food? How much was it? Two cars. So the opportunity cost of a food the opportunity cost of one food or a food is two cars in the US. Now in Japan, the opportunity cost of a food is what? Five cars. So who's better at producing food? The U.S. In terms of comparative advantage, if you remember, our story was such that the absolute advantage was with Japan. They were better at producing both goods. They were more productive than us at producing both goods. But in terms of thinking about, well, what do you have to give up to make something? Well, what do you have to give up to make something? We find that the United States has a lower cost of food production. So therefore, the US has a lower opportunity cost of food production. Having a lower opportunity cost implies you have a comparative advantage. All right, 
so I get it now. We kind of start to look at the cost. So in the US, uh, the opportunity cost of a car is how much? What does it cost for a car? A half. All right, so um, if you start to get screwed up with the math on that, kind of come back to trying to word out the equation. So on your sheets, we had production or labor productivity that looked like this. Two cars could be traded for one food, right? So it, on a side margin on your exam or something, when you're freaking out because you're seeing things that you didn't think about, you start going back to the basics here and you say, okay, wait a second, I know, I can look at this, I can look at it a couple different ways. The slope of this function is two. I can be there or I can be there. So I can give up 16 cars and get eight units of food. My labor productivity tells me I can trade two cars for one food. So, or if you were thinking the other way, 16 cars could be traded for eight food. You start to have a little, like you're learning a different language, right? You say something and then all of a sudden an equation explodes out on the board. All right, so now what we're looking for is the opportunity cost of a car, one car. And so whether you thought this way or whether you thought this way, just work it out. I can make a 1B over here. What I do to one side of the equation, I gotta do to the other. Or I got a 16 over here to get it to be one. I divide by 16. What I do to one side, I got to do the other. So either way, you come up with the cost of a car being one half of a food. In Japan, the opportunity cost of a car is one fifth. Same thing. I know that I can trade 25 cars for five food. So on the margins, I'm thinking 25 cars equals five food. I don't want the cost of 25 cars. I want the cost of one car. Divide by 25, divide by 25, one fifth. Who produces food, or who produces cars cheaper? Japan, a fifth is 0.2 of a food, a half is 0.5 of a food, 0.2 is less than, uh, or 0.2 is less than 0.5. So Japan has a comparative advantage. So therefore, Japan <coughs> is the low cost producer, which means they have a comparative advantage in cars. All right, so what would be the next step then? If we were to make both countries better off with trade, which is what we started off trying to do, what's our next step? How do these two countries make each other better off knowing this information? Specialization, Specialization yes. So we're not quite to the price part, but to specialize. What is this telling you who should do what? Japan does cars, US does food, and they meet in the middle and trade later. It's kind of the direction we're heading, right? So whatever you have a comparative advantage in should be the thing that you're wanting to um, <coughs> specialize in. Now, would a country really like to specialize at point, let's say that the United States starts off here at point A, they don't, care about Japan, they don't know who Japan is or whatever. So point A reflects their consumption point as well as their production point. They're just happy little on their own island. And then Japan's discovered and there's a whole other country over there and there's their production possibilities. We think about this trading idea. Would the United States want to go to the point of full specialization all the way to point B? Why would that maybe not be a smart thing to do? Japan cuts you off, right? So now we're like, oh boy, well, we don't want to be dependent on Japan, another country for all of our cars, right? Although we're holding a lot of food, so that's a good thing. 
All right, so the only point I want to make here is that for the economic model, which is not reality, which is based on some simplifying assumptions, we would want to fully specialize in the production of that good. In reality, there might be other things that would need to be taken into consideration of whether you'd want to do full specialization. But to really show the, to kind of push things to the nth degree with this economic model, to make both parties as best off as possible, ideally, you would go to point B and fully specialize in that good. So they would change their production point from A to B. Japan, on the other hand, would change their production point. Let's say that they were starting off at three. What is this number? Fifteen? Rise over run. Rise over run. What'd you say? Ten. Who said that? I still can't see. Oh, there it is. Jesse's got it. All right. So ten. Rise over run, right? So the slope of this curve is negative five technically is the slope, right? So negative five. Rise over run is uh, down 25. Well, that's, I was pointing to the wrong thing here. Down 25 over five. So 25 divided by five is five. So I like to put the little reminder here what the slope is. The slope is negative five. The slope over here was negative two. <laughs> so if I go over one, two, right? Let me do it a little bit slower. If I go over one, I go up five. If I go over another one, I go up five more. I thought I heard some people thinking that I was wrong on this. All right. So be careful. Be careful on where you start. Go back to that rise over run. I've screwed up many times in my life. I've studied this for a long time, doing lots of math, and I've made these mistakes. Go slow. Even those of you who are brainiacs in math need to probably slow down a step and really think, rise over run, where am I starting? One, up five, over one, up five. Five plus five is 10. So that is the right number is 10. Now you can do that a couple different ways too. Is the opportunity cost going to be the slope of your? Yes, that's where I'm going next. So there is a connection here between the cost and the slope which we were hinting to earlier. So the slope of the production possibilities curve is negative five. Oh, look at this. In Japan, the opportunity cost is five, which is a positive number, by the way. There's a little thing with the negative sign. <coughs> the opportunity cost of food in the United States is two. So there's a little helpful hint to double check your work on an exam or on your homework. Let's put a little key point here, a key helpful hint. The slope of the production possibilities curve is always equal to the opportunity cost of whatever you are measuring on the horizontal axis. It's a nice little double check. The slope of the production possibilities curve is always equal to the opportunity cost of whatever you're measuring, measuring on the horizontal axis. We happen to be measuring food. And the opportunity cost was equal to those numbers. Now, for those of you who are kind of puckered up in your seat because you're, you're kind of more on the math geek side, which I applaud you in different times, 
I'm a little too loose with that definition. Technically, it's the opposite of the slope, right? Because of the negative thing. I don't want to get wrapped up in that type of stuff. This is a, just a quick little double check for you. The slope is 2. It's really the slope is negative 2. The cost is a positive 2. So we're thinking about the cost in terms of a positive cost, right? A positive number. So there's just a little, little slip. So those of you who are puckered up, you can make that little extra note. Otherwise, those of you that are unpuckered and relaxed, then just leave it the way it is. Will it always be? It'll always be. And it's always negative, so yes, it'll always be that. So the production possibilities curve always has a negative slope to it. Okay. Well, isn't this fun? Okay, so now, where do we go from there? So, Japan, if they were at point A without trade, so this is kind of the no trade point, let's say, and they're going to move to point B, the point of full specialization in the good in which they have a comparative advantage, now we got to figure out the trading thing. All right, so let's just... Uh, Let's make an assumption here to kind of motivate this. So showing the gains from trade. Showing the gains from trade. Number one, we're going to start off with an assumption. Assume that the two countries have negotiated a world price, a world price of three cars for every one food. So if this is the world price equal to three cars for every food, would you say that that's the price of cars or the price of food? If it's a three cars for one food. The way I have it written here, if I just say that the world price is three, is that the price of cars or the price of food? It's the price of food, right? So when we go to the store and we buy one Mountain Dew, it's $1.50 per Mountain Dew. So whatever we're doing it on a per unit basis, that's the price of the good. So the world price of food is three cars for every food. But it's not too difficult to think about the world price of cars being one third of a food per car, like that. Again, we might see that concept a little easier putting our equation goggles on and writing out what we stated here. Assume that the two countries have negotiated a world price of three cars for every food three cars equals one food. There goes those equation goggles again. And now we kind of see it, right? One food cost me three cars, or one car cost me a third of a food. All right, well, this type of notation is going to help us when we get to chap the later chapters on exchange rates. We're going to come back to international trade and exchange rates of currencies, and so uh, that type of notation will pay some dividends there. All right, so. With that price, which country? Well, okay, we're getting we're getting there. So with that price, we haven't shown it yet. That was step number one. So showing the gains from trade. First of all, we're going to say that they negotiated a, a world price of that. So how do we go? How do we show? So number two. For. Um, 
the United States for the US, one way to tackle this problem would be to show the gains from trade where they started versus where they ended, right? So with trade, without trade type of thing. So for the US, <clears throat> um, let's, uh, let's show the gains from trade. Let's show the gains from trade um, in terms of cars. Let's show the gains from trade in terms of cars. So to do that, what I want you to imagine is the United States trading to get back to their original amount of food. So US will trade to get back to its original uh, quantity of food. In other words, the no trade point at point A. So we were at point A. We're thinking, OK, let's try trade. I know. I'll make all the food. And then I'm going to trade back to getting 4,000 food again, all right? So I was at four, I specialized, and I trade to get back. So let's do that. US will trade back to get to point A. So the US wants to sell. US needs to sell 4,000 food at the world price of food equal to three cars for every food. Hmm. How many cars are we going to have after trade? How much? 12,000. So I'm selling four. I'm dumping on the market for every unit of food. I'm getting three, 4,000 times three, 12,000. So for the United States, we get up to 12,000. Now, how much food do we have? Four. Well, wait a second. We're outside the production possibilities curve. I thought I just got done saying about 15, 20 minutes ago that that's illegal. You're not having to use your resources. What else? What's that? <coughs> what type of curve is it? Why are we able to be outside production possibilities? Because it's trade possibilities. It's consumption possibilities. Nothing's changed with my economy. I still have the same amount of labor. Remember, we had this as a simplified case. But just imagine that all of the resources in the economy are fixed. The only thing I've done is switched from A to B. I've switched my production so that I'm specializing in food. And what I'm really doing here is not producing at point C, but I'm consuming at point C. There's the gains from trade. I'm able to consume outside of what I could do on my own. Right? That's the benefits from trade. That's the gains from trade. That's Tom and Jen. Same thing happened with them. Jen does the fishing. Tom does the coconut harvesting. They trade. They make each other better off than what they could do independently. Same result. All right. So. What would you say the gain from trade is? What is the gain from trade? 
Because that's what we are ultimately doing here is showing the gain or gains from trade. You want to do like a quantity? Oh, quantity, yeah. I mean, you get 4,000. Four thousand. Right. I just want to be specific here that the gain from trade is not 12,000, but four is what we were shooting for. That's how many more cars we have uh, because of trade. So the U.S. needs to sell 4,000 food at uh, three uh, cars per unit of food. Um, so that implies they're going to get, uh, let me uh, do this a little bit differently. Four th how much money do they need to spend? They need to spend 4,000 food times three cars for every food. Now this is where this notation, when we get back to exchange rates, is going to come in handy. What are we left with? Four times three is 12,000. 12,000 what? Cars, because the Fs cancel with each other. Kind of F over one, if we're multiplying that. It's just kind of a helpful thing. You don't have to know it, but uh, it helps us say, okay, I'm gonna get 3,000 cars, or 12,000 cars at the end of the day. And finally, our big wrap up here is, therefore, a gain of 4,000 cars. Yep. The difference between, between, and I really say between here, yes, because C and A, there's no difference in the food, all the difference is being thrown into cars. So this green supposed to be straight, but ended up being a little squiggly, maybe too much coffee for me this morning. Uh, that is the consumption possibilities curve. The consumption possibilities curve. Now, what is the slope of that curve? A little bit tricky, not quite as easy to see. Let me help you out. If I give up one food, I get how many cars? Three. Bingo. That's rise over run. Now check this out. This is kind of fun for me anyway. I like to say I give up one, I get one, two. That's where I was before. And then boom, bingo, bango, bongo. I'm outside the, con the production possibilities frontier. So the slope is running one, rising three. The slope is negative three, which happens to be equal to the world price of whatever we're measuring on the horizontal axis. So there's a connection there again between slopes and the trading that's going on. Okay. Let's see how well you're doing. On your own, well, you can work with your neighbor or neighbors Calculate the gains from trade in terms of cars for Japan. On your own, working with your neighbor. Calculate the gains from trade in terms of cars for Japan. I want it in terms of cars. So I want you to do the same exercise in terms of cars for Japan. I know some of you are stuck. How many cars do I have right now? 25. I'm sitting there with 25,000 cars. I know that I can trade three cars for one food. I want to get back to the point where I was before trade with the same quantity of food. So I want to get to some point where I'm buying 3,000 food. Talk with your neighbor. See what you come up with. You're buying 3,000 food you are sitting fat with cars and you're getting hungry. It's 
too quiet. You guys are lost, aren't you? Come on, start talking. Hey, John, what do you think? I'm clueless on this one. This stuff's happening so fast. <laughs> Uh, they want to get back to having 3,000 food, which is where they were prior to the trade deals. So before trade, we've got 10 and 3. Before trade, we have, maybe I'll do more, put their food first here. Uh, we've got 3 food and 10 cars. What's that? What'd you say, Michael? 16,000 cars. Okay? Everybody get that? Is that the gain? Gain six. Gain six. Good. All right. So let's walk through that. Before trade, you're at point A. You move to point B. So you specialize. I'm going to give you kind of the shorthand here to write down in your notes. Specialize, which means you're going to have zero food and 25 cars. There's your point B, right? So this is really point B, this is point A. And what we're trying to do is see what we got after trade. So after trade, what we want to get to is having again 3,000 food and X amount of cars. So the X Michael came up with was 16. All right, was our final resting point. So, um, how'd you do it, Michael? What was your what was your logic? Okay, doing what? You're buying three, right? Where'd you get your math? How'd you get to sixteen? So I, let's just go where Michael ended up and see if we can at least kind of conceptualize. So you're at, you're sitting here at some point C, right? A gain of six, that's what I heard you verbalize. So graphically, you're doing something like this. So how did you get there? What was the first step that got you there? Five food to three food. Five food to three food, all right. Uh, not five, zero. zero. Point B is at zero food, so we're buying three food. Right? Everybody with me? You're sitting fat with cars. You're at point B. You got 25,000 cars. You're getting hungry. Point A is before trade. Then we specialize and move to point B. Now we're sitting at point B, and we're going to get back to having the same amount that we had before, which was three. So we're going to need to, the key thing here is we're going to buy 3,000 units of food and what's it going to at the world price of food as Rachel said so we're going to take 3,000 food we need to buy 3,000 food but of course we need to pay the price the price of the food the world price of food is three let me insert it this way three cars for every food is the world price so what are you paying for the food with? 9,000 cars. So we get it through a different way. We get the Fs canceling out. 3 times 3,000 is 9,000. Graphically, we're coming down 9,000. And we're going over 3,000, which is right in line with the slope of the consumption possibilities curve, which has a slope of three, the world price. Down nine, 
down 9 over 3, 9 divided by 3 is, is 3, right? So it's the same thing. The slope equals negative 3. And the gain from trade then, one sec, my own. So we're going to buy 9,000 cars, leaving us with 25,000 minus 9,000 equals our 16,000 cars. And therefore, the gain, the gain from trade is 25, I'm sorry, not 25, 16 minus 10, what we had before, as you astutely pointed out, Japan gains 6,000 cars, which is this vertical distance here from A to C. Now, question, Michael? Uh, well, I did it, I went from five to like I did the exact way you did the other one, the same answer. Was that just a coincidence? Or is it always good? If you went from here, yeah, it's some sort of weird coincidence in your brain, and you need to correct that, because it won't be right the next time you do it, likely. So we start here. We're starting here, and then we're selling, just like what, what we're doing here, we're actually selling cars or buying food. You can think of it either way. We're selling cars or buying food. I knew that I wanted to get back to 3,000, and so that's how I did it. Chelsea? Did you have the schedule, though, like what you did when, like, wouldn't it work? Like, if you had a schedule, like, you could still go backwards and do it like you did. What, what point did you go backwards on, though? Five? Yeah. You can go backwards still. So you can go from five to three, and then you're just going like. But, you, but you're never, on, on this schedule, if you're doing the three, you're doing it backwards. You're not going to get to the right spot. I'll take a look. Why don't we talk after class? I'll, I'll take a look. You'd only have the 6,000 Yeah, because you're not from the right starting point. You really need to start at point B and trade it. The, the slope is definitely the same in each, in each case. Point B is your point of specialization. That's your production possibility. Now, before you wrap up here, there's a problem with this that I think maybe somebody was starting to allude to. Can both these countries be at point C? And really, remember this, I'm talking about Japan being at C star and A star and B star, if we put our star. Is it possible for Japan to be at point C and the United States to be at point C? No, why? What? Tell me about world production and world consumption. What's going on there? The United States is selling 4,000 to the Japan is only buying 3,000. All right. So if we look at their post-trade quantities, they don't make sense. Look, you can look in terms of food or you can look in terms of cars, but 16,000 cars for the Japanese. 12,000 for the United States. 12 plus 16 is how much? 28. How much on the world exists? 25. So that part of it doesn't make sense because there's a difference between showing the gains from trade in terms of one good or the other and the actual post-trade quantities. So. For next time, I want you to do this homework problem for Monday. Calculate point D for each country. Calculate D and D star. What you're doing is you're just showing the gains from trade in terms of the other good. Now we're just showing the gains from trade in terms of food or, uh, for each country. How do, when we talk about the real world, how do we show the gains from trade? What do we what do we use as our do we use cars or food or what do we use? Money, dollars. We show the gains from trade in terms of a common unit. Here I'm choo I'm choosing the common unit to be cars. We could do food, we could do a combination of both. We'll pick up there next time.